Merry Christmas. I've been, uh, a few people have been saying it's time to say Happy New Year, but it's not. It's still Christmas. This is the second day of Christmas. Larry, how many days of Christmas are there? Twelve. Twelve days of Christmas. So for ten more days, we get to say Merry Christmas. So if you're a person who uh, likes to get caught up in the culture wars and get upset about red cups at Starbucks and all of that, the truth is... Up until yesterday, the appropriate thing to say, uh, you know, you can say Merry Christmas anytime you want, I guess, but the appropriate thing is Happy Holidays because it's the holy days of Advent leading up until Christmas Day, and then it's Merry Christmas for 12 days. So Merry Christmas, everybody. I'm glad you're here, and it's really fun to see everybody on this day. I mean, I was expecting half this many people, so... Thanks for showing up. And I also want to make a, say a special thanks to our volunteers who are here this morning because, you know, uh, as few people decide to come to church on Sunday after Christmas, the volunteers may not want to be here either, but they showed up to make this happen. And cr- night before last was amazing. So many people were here to help, and it was beautiful and just a, a great time. So, And your presence, believe it or not, makes a huge difference at all of the worship services because it's a worship service. I don't know uh, if you know this, but there's a a whole kind of movement in certain types of church to say this is a worship experience. And so they'll tell us, people who work at churches, to craft the worship experience in X, Y, and Z way so that you'll get more people. And I always struggle with that because... I like worship service. We are here to serve one another, and we serve each other by saying the liturgy and singing the songs and all of those sorts of things. So thank you for being here this morning. Next Sunday, church will be at 10 o'clock as well. We'll just have one service, and then the following Sunday, we'll go back to having two services at 8.30 and 11. So um, one more week of this schedule, and then we'll go back to our regular schedule until this time next year. So um, anyway, those are the, that's the main announcement that I had this morning. And then after the first of the year, we'll start up pastor's Bible study. And there are uh, several new things gonna, that are going to be starting in January and February also. So make sure you pay attention to the end of week email so that you can see what those are um, and join into them also. Would you join me? Uh, well, no, now it's time for our prelude. So I would encourage you to Put your feet flat on the floor in front of you and sit up straight. I would take a big, deep breath in through your nose, out through your mouth, and allow yourself to soak into this moment.
Would you join me for our call to worship? I will say the bold words and you can say the most bold words. Jesus said, this is my house. So come into this space, just as you are. Come into this space. Speaking your truth. Come into this space. With your authentic self. This is God's home. This is our home. Let us worship God. And now would you please stand for our opening hymn, number 246, Joy to the World, verses 1 and 4. You may be seated. I think I left my mic on. I apologize if I left my mic on and <laughs> didn't, you didn't get to hear everything Karen was seeing because of my voice, but uh, I'll do better next time. Make sure to get that sucker turned off. I just reached down. I was like, uh-oh, the switch was still on. Research uh, shows that on average, humans make about 30, 35,000 choices in one day. 35,000 choices. In the prayer of confession, we acknowledge the moments when our choices do not reflect God's love and we ask for grace. So let us pray together, trusting that God is with us in each of those 35,000 moments, cheering us on and guiding us home. Let us pray. I'll again say the bold words and you will say the most bold words. We could offer welcome, but we often choose judgment. We could choose action, but we often choose silence. We could choose advocacy, but we often choose comfort. We could choose truth, but we often choose ignorance. We could choose God, but we often choose ourselves. Forgive us, gracious God, for the moments when we choose poorly. Open our hearts to choose you, to choose community, to choose love. Gratefully we pray, amen. Family of faith, no matter how we choose, we cannot lose God's love. It is undeserved, overwhelming, ever-present, and always, always with us. So may we accept God's grace and use it as fuel for better days. Hear and believe this good news. No matter how many times we walk away, God always welcomes us home. We are loved, we are forgiven, we are invited. Thanks be to God. Amen. Would you please bow your heads in prayer? Author God, Scripture tells us that when Jesus taught in the temple, all who heard were amazed. We want to be amazed too. We want to hear your word with new ears. We want to be unraveled and transformed by the truth tucked between those sentences. We want to be opened up by the hope in these holy pages. We want to be amazed 
So as we read today, transport us to those early days in the temple. Open our hearts so we can hear your word like never before. We are listening. We are grateful. Amen. Our first reading today is a poem called Chosen Home, and the author is unknown. There are a million ways to choose a home. We choose to make it work. We hang a wreath on the door of our shoebox apartment. We invite company over and we ask, would you like coffee with that? We choose to make the most of it. We take up water coloring or kickboxing and show up to class. And we mostly embarrass ourselves, but we're there. We choose to not go it alone. We sign up to volunteer and make ourselves a name tag. We slide weary bones into weary church pews. We shake hands and say hello. We let the music cover us like a blanket or like a prayer. We choose to love what we have. We look in the mirror and speak kindly to our body. We buy flowers at the market and arrange them in jelly jars. There are a million ways to choose a home. So like Jesus in the temple, we choose to stay. We choose to speak. Who took up space because he knew he was home? I invite you to do the same. Put your body where your soul feels alive. Give yourself permission to take up space there. Stay as long as it takes. Return as often as you need. There are a million ways to choose home. Choose wisely. We need you here. The stable lamp is lighted Whose glow shall wake the sky The star shall bend the voices And every stone shall stone shall cry and straw like gold shall shine a barn shall have a heaven a stall become a shrine this child through David's city shall
Our second reading is the Gospel of Luke, chapter 2, verses 41 through 52. This is the story of Jesus at around 12 years old um, when he and his family had gone to Jerusalem, and then when uh, his family left and the whole group that they were with left, uh, his mom and dad, Joseph and Mary, couldn't find him. And when they returned to the temple, uh, they found him there with um, some of the rabbis and elders and uh, entering into theological discussion with them. So what I would like for you to do this morning, now that you know what the story is going to be, is to engage your imagination. This is one of those stories that I feel like we can feel. We all have had somebody in our lives that we probably would never want to lose. It might be a puppy or something even, you know, or uh, a stuffed animal or um, a person that we want to take care of and keep up with. And the idea that we can't find them um, is a terrifying feeling. So, um, but also there's some really fun kind of mischievous things that maybe you could potentially imagine in this story as well. So if you need to close your eyes so that you can engage your imagination in this story, then feel free to do that. I won't think you're asleep. But if you don't open your eyes afterwards, I might call you out uh, Wayne, if you don't open your eyes, I'll just say, hey, Wayne, wake up, and uh, you know, then everybody will know you're asleep, but there's grace that abounds, and so we'll forgive you anyway. Hear this gospel of Luke found in chapter 2, starting with verse 41. Each year, his parents went to Jerusalem for the Passover festival, and when he was 12 years old, they went up to Jerusalem according to their custom. After the festival was over, they were returning home, but the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem, and his parents didn't know it. Supposing that he was among their band of travelers, they journeyed on for a full day while looking for him among their family and friends. When they didn't find Jesus, they returned to Jerusalem to look for him. And after three days, they found him in the temple. He was sitting among the teachers listening to them, and putting questions to them. Everyone who heard him was amazed by his understanding and his answers. His parents saw him and they were shocked. His mother said, child, why have you treated us like this? Listen, your father and I have been worried. We've been looking for you. Jesus replied, why were you looking for me? Didn't you know that it was necessary for me to be in my father's house? But they didn't understand what he said to them. Jesus went down to Nazareth with them and was obedient to them. His mother cherished every word in her heart. Jesus matured in wisdom and years and in favor with God and with the people. This is the word of God for all of God's creation. Thanks be to God. May God give us wisdom and courage for interpretation, and may God give us wisdom and courage as we try to apply the truth of this scripture to our lives. Amen. This story is fascinating to me for a lot of reasons. One is it's really easy to recognize some of the cultural context that is going on. Luke wants us to know how old Jesus was. He was 12. He was entering into his early adulthood, teenage years, and what happens in Jewish culture when a boy turns around 12 years old or a girl turns around 12 years old? Anybody know? Bar mitzvah or bat mitzvah, right? Now, the modern practice of bar mitzvah and bat mitzvah is more aligned with uh, some, some changes that were made in the medieval times. And so if you're ever, has anybody ever been to a synagogue and seen somebody's bar or bat mitzvah? It's an amazing experience. And I hope that if you haven't, that maybe someday you'll get that opportunity to go. But the practices that, that uh, Jewish and Reformed Jewish folks do today around bar and bat mitzvah is more aligned with medieval practices than we think the thing that Jesus was going through at this time. But what we do know is bar and bat mitzvah was a thing in the ancient Near East, 
And that is potentially what was going on with Jesus. So what would have been happening is Joseph would have been teaching him. Joseph would have been spending time teaching him his trade, but also preparing him for his bar mitzvah. Now, one of the things in my understanding that would happen in the ancient Near East is that a young Jewish boy would sit down with rabbis and would answer a lot of questions, and the way they would answer the questions were with questions. You know what I'm talking about? So, for example, I heard a man one time who uh, was going to seminary in Jerusalem. He was studying with a bunch of people who were studying to be rabbis, and they went to this major synagogue in Jerusalem that had some magnificent art in it. And as they were touring the synagogue and looking at the art, the rabbi comes out of his office and approaches them, and this man that I heard telling the story said that he looks at the rabbi and he says, um, which of these paintings is your favorite? And the rabbi answers the question by saying, do you have children? And if he would have answered yes, conversation over. But he says, yes, why? So he answers with a question, and the rabbi says, which of them is your favorite? Answering the question with a question. So my understanding is that in the ancient Near East, what would happen is at a bar mitzvah, when the studying was taking place, a young man would sit with rabbis around him, and he would answer questions with questions, and as long as the questions continued, the student was doing well, and if the student got to a point where they couldn't answer any of the questions with questions, they were done. And at the end of the period of time, if the student, if the young man had impressed one of the rabbis or multiple rabbis enough, one of or the multiple rabbis would say, come, follow me. Sound familiar? Jesus called his disciples by using that exact language, but they had not passed the test because they were fishermen and tax collectors and zealots. They had different jobs that they were doing. They were not rabbis. So they hadn't been said, come, follow me, to then begin training to be a rabbi. They were the B team or the C team. They were not the smartest kids in the class, and Jesus called them to follow him as he was going to be their rabbi and to teach them. I love that story because that tells me that people like me and people like Maurice could be called by Jesus to study with him. People who, who, who have talent but maybe aren't like the most theologically astute people around. No offense, Maurice. <laughs> I hope that brings you some hope that you don't have to be the smartest, most talented, most impressive person theologically or intellectually to be a follower of Jesus. But that begs the question, what is required of us to be followers of Jesus? Which begs another question. Can being a follower of Jesus change for us as we grow older? Which begs another question for us. How would it change? Which begs another question for us. How would we respond to that change? Which begs another question. What would happen if Jesus grew to a place that where we didn't know if we could follow any longer? Or if the world around us changed to a point to where we didn't know how to follow Jesus in that world. See, Joseph and Mary had this tradition. Every year, they would go with this band of merrymakers from Bethlehem, which, by the way, interestingly enough, Bethlehem means bread village. Think about that. Bread village is where the bread of life comes from. Anyway, so they would go from Bethlehem to Jerusalem 
for the Passover. It was this major festival, and they likely had traditions. They would go eat at this place, and they would go visit these family members, and they would go see these friends from high school or whatever, and they would spend time visiting and having fun and having a Passover meal with everyone, and it was a great time, and it was also a time of deep spiritual renewal for them. And so they start heading home, and they expect for Jesus to be with the band of merrymakers somewhere. They're not too concerned with exactly who. They're pretty trusting. It takes a village to raise a child, or maybe it takes a village to learn how to raise a child. I don't know for sure. Still trying to figure that one out. I'm grateful for all of the wisdom I've received over the years as I try to figure out how to be a parent. But what they didn't recognize is that through Jesus growing and spending time with that village and hanging around Joseph, and Joseph did an amazing job of teaching this young man to prepare for his bar mitzvah, that he had changed. He had grown. He wasn't meeting their expectations anymore. Has that ever happened for you? Have you ever noticed all of a sudden the Jesus that you knew isn't exactly the Jesus that you know. Somehow it maybe seems like Jesus changed. Maybe, maybe the Jesus that you've always loved and worshipped resurrected as a different Jesus. And you connect to this new Jesus more or maybe you have changed to the point to where you're not seeing Jesus meet your expectations. I think maybe that's part of what was happening with Mary. She was upset for very obvious reasons. If you've ever lost a child, like they wander off and you don't know where they are, it's terrifying. One time when I was in seminary, uh, Michelle and I took Elise and Emery to this bowling alley slash barbecue restaurant, which really grosses me out now that I think about it. You're eating ribs and then sticking your hands in a bowling ball that isn't yours, and then eating some more ribs. Anyway, we were getting ready to leave, and Emery was a toddler, so we're like getting her all bundled up because it's Denver and it's like the Arctic, in my opinion. And so we're getting her all bundled up, and I look around, and Elise is nowhere to be found. And so I walk over by the, where the video games that she was fighting us about all the time wanting to go play, and she wasn't there. And So I start looking around, and I can't find her, and I go up. They have a little upstairs area. She's not up there. And by now, my heart is racing, and I'm starting to panic, and Michelle is looking at me like, it was your job to keep up with her, and so I'm afraid I'm going to be murdered and lose my child. And so I walk outside, and you know the end of the story is good because you've seen Elise here with us, right? So we, I go outside, and I don't see her. I can't find her, and I'd walked through the bar room, and I looked around, and this four-year-old wasn't hanging out in the bar and so I walk out on the sidewalk I can't see her anywhere and I walk about half of a block to the corner thinking maybe she had turned the corner and just praying 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 the whole way and when I say walk it's more like a jog and I got to the corner and she wasn't there and I thought she's gone she is gone we have lost our child and when I walked back in she was walking out from behind the bar which I hope isn't necessarily predictive of the future. I don't know, bartenders make good tips sometimes. But it was terrifying. I can't imagine what Joseph and Mary were feeling when they couldn't find Jesus, and then they go and look for him for three days. And when they find him, he's sitting there answering questions with questions. And I'm sure their hearts were overflowing with pride and with joy, but also Jesus was no longer meeting their expectation of being this nice little boy who was going to do exactly what they said. It's hard to watch things change around us. It's hard when God isn't meeting our expectations. And I think like Mary, when things are changing all around us, 
and Jesus, God, is no longer meeting our expectations, I don't know about you, but I get a little confused. And when I start to get confused, my typical reaction is one of frustration, which leads to anger. We're not ready to let go of our expectations. We're not ready to let go of the way things were, but the world is moving on and God is shaping and crafting this world and we want God to meet our expectations, but the truth of the matter is Jesus is about God's business. God is about the business of God, not us. And so the challenge is, what is God's business? What is the business of our Father, our Creator? What is the business of the Son? Jesus is about the future. And that's what got him in so much trouble. Because he wasn't willing to allow things to stay the same. He wasn't willing to allow lepers to just live in leper colonies. He wasn't willing to conserve everything around him and be some sort of, in a literal way, conservative and keep people in chains in a cave just because they had some sort of mental illness that they thought was demon possession. He was about the future. He was about changing things and shaping things into the way they ought to be, not the way they are. And sometimes that progress is hard because it forces us to change and Jesus is not meeting our expectations and golly, we're trained to make sure that God meets our expectations. But the reality is, Jesus is about the business of his father, so what is the father's business? And how do we join in being partners in that? Because God's business, the Father's business, should be our business. And our business isn't us. Our business is them. Jesus came to heal the sick. Jesus came to take care of orphans and widows Jesus came to set the prisoners free. Jesus came to heal the oppressed. That's the Father's business, and that's our business. Let's get to work. In the name of our creator, redeemer, and sustainer. Amen. Would you join me as we respond to the word by saying this affirmation of faith that is on the screens? Central United Methodist Church, my question is this, what do you believe? We believe that God has come to us as a little child, making our weakness his strength, securing our salvation by becoming one of us blessing us with a steadfast Savior, filling our hearts with joy to be shared with one another. We believe that God has birthed righteousness and justice into the world, giving us a law that will be written upon our hearts, making the cause of the oppressed the highest priority, declaring an everlasting reign of peace, defeating the power of pain and suffering, we believe that God calls us to participate in this reality of love, inviting us to proclaim Christ's resurrection at the table, transforming us as disciples to go out into the world, sending us forth to announce his kingdom of peace and comfort, challenging us to see everyone as nothing less than beloved children. This we believe, this we preach, this we seek to embody in word and deed. It's time for our offering, and because uh, we don't have as many people here this morning, I need three people. Uh, is it three, Don? Oh, we're good with what we have. Never mind. Thank you. I love a church where people just stand up and yell at the preacher, by the way. 
you are welcome to speak any time during my sermons. Raise your hand, ask questions, and I'm not kidding. I'm, I really mean that. I, I love interactive church, so. <clears throat> there are many things we choose in our lives. We choose what kind of car we want, where we want to live, the career path we prefer. We choose decaf or caffeinated. Caffeinated's the right answer, by the way. We choose AM or PM. We choose today or tomorrow. Today's the right answer, by the way. We choose to read the book or see the movie. The book is the right answer. We choose dogs or cats. Dogs are the right answer. And we choose where we want to give our time, our energy, and our money. So today we're invited to choose this place, this community, this family of faith. Today we're invited to choose generosity, trusting that God can take whatever we give and use it for good. So let us give our tithes and our offerings now. God, we are grateful for all that you have given us, and we pray that you will take this portion that we've given you, that you will multiply it, and that you will use it for your kingdom and your glory. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Did everyone receive um, a communion cup that would like one? Oh, Maurice, you need one also? There you go. Anybody else? You may be seated. At my house, people don't do what I tell them, so it's weird that you wait for me. 
to tell you to sit down. Watch next Sunday when they're here. They'll do what they want. It doesn't matter. <clears throat> I love the Sunday after Christmas. There, it's just like this time of peace, the kind of hustle and bustle of Christmas Eve is over, and the calmness is here, and it brings back memories of like getting a little frustrated that I have to go to church instead of playing with my toys. But also it brings back memories of just this deep sense of belonging and love that the church I grew up going to gave me. We didn't have a youth group, but we had a whole bunch of older folks who would ask me about my life and tell me they read about the football game that I lost and ask me how I was feeling and it was meaningful. And so we do a lot of remembering, right? Church kind of brings back a lot of memories for us. And so even communion, I have very specific memories of taking communion as a child, mostly laughing in inappropriate times, getting in trouble. But they're beautiful memories. But I also have these memories of taking communion that literally changed my life. I hope you have those as well. Times when you took communion and you felt the presence of God in ways that you weren't expecting and maybe you had never felt before and maybe you will never feel again. I hope that this morning, as we remember together, that that will happen for you, that you will experience the presence of God in a real way. On the night that Jesus gathered with his crazy group of friends. They were having a Passover meal, much like the one that he was at just prior to the story we read. Three days later, after that Passover meal, Jesus would be found in a garden. Three days after the Passover meal we just read about, he was found at the temple. I don't think that is accidental. But at that last Passover meal, who knows how many times he had been in Jerusalem for it, how many times he had been maybe in that same exact upper room, it was completely different, the last one. The last one, he was with all of his friends, and they were expecting this major change, this thing to happen, but not what happened. Jesus didn't meet their expectations. Jesus met Jesus' expectations. And at that meal, he explained to them what his expectations were when he looked them in the eye as he took a piece of bread from the table and he gave thanks for it and he broke it and he looked them in the eye and he said, this is it. This is my body broken for you. This is the whole thing. This is what it's about. Love and grace and forgiveness, even for you, betrayer, and even for you, deniers. And their lives were changed forever from that moment on. May ours be as well. The body of Christ broken for you. And when the supper was over, they had had several cups of wine. If you've ever been to a Passover Seder, you know that. And there's this last cup that's sitting there that is not really supposed to be touched. It represents a lot of things. But Jesus broke with tradition and changed things because that's what Jesus does. Breaks with tradition and changes things because Jesus is about the future. And he picked that cup up and he gave thanks for it and he blessed it and then he once again looked into their eyes and he said, this is my blood of the new covenant. The new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. As often as you drink this, remember me. 
family of God, the cup of salvation. God, we know you are not about the past, but we know you use the past to stir us into the future. So thank you for this old, old tradition of bread and wine. Make them be for us your body and your blood broken and poured out so that we can move into the future with you as your body and your blood broken and poured out to point everyone we come into contact with toward your grace and your love so that this world can become what you want it to be, what you are creating it to be. In Jesus' name we pray. And now would you please stand for our closing hymn, Go Tell It on the Mountain. Thank you all uh, for being here today. Your presence, I needed to see you. I hope you needed to see each other. I hope you felt the presence of God with you this morning. I hope you were inspired. I hope you are able to go forth. And as you are going and doing whatever it is that you need to do and want to do this day and for the next seven days, may your hearts find grace. And may your souls know peace. And may your minds be renewed. May your eyes see the light and your ears hear the glory of Jesus Christ in your midst. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thank you all for being here this morning. Merry Christmas.